Okay, uh, good evening, everyone. Can everyone uh, hear me? Just maybe wave your hand if you can. That's good. Okay, thanks, Simone. Um, look, my name is Jeremy Watson, and uh, I'm a volunteer with the Vets for Climate Action, and welcome to this uh, webinar on the carbon cost of veterinary anaesthesia. So to begin the proceedings tonight, I'd just like to do an acknowledgement of country. In the spirit of reconciliation, Vets for Climate Action acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. And before we begin, just a couple of little housekeeping things. If everyone could try and um, keep their cameras on just to perhaps create a little bit of atmosphere um, and also your microphone on mute. Um, we will have a Q&A at the end of the session, so please uh, post any questions in the chat um, forum and we'll try and get to them at the end of the evening. Uh, a little bit about my background, as I said, I'm a volunteer with the Vets for Climate Action. I've been practising for over 30 years. Um, I'm a partner in a six-vet small animal practice in suburban northwest Melbourne. In 2011, uh, we built a new building with a lot of uh, sustainable features, which delivered a lot of benefits for us. And then in 2019, I joined the newly formed Vets for Climate Action and was able to share our experiences and gain new insights with a group of like-minded vets. I've been working on the, uh, been working on the uh, climate care program for vets for the last two and a half years. And this was launched in March of this year. And I'd strongly urge you, uh, if you haven't already, uh, had a look at it to go onto our website and follow it up. In 2021, we became the first vet clinic to be registered carbon neutral on the Australian Government Climate Active Register. And I think the main benefit of this um, was the process we went through to give us an understanding of the components of the carbon footprint of a vet practice. The next challenge is how to prioritise and reduce the components to zero, which really leads us to why we're here tonight. Before I introduce Donna, I just uh, might give uh, a few of you who don't know a bit of background about the history of the VFCA. It started with a Facebook post in 2019. Um, veterinarian Dr. Jeanette Kessel sent out a rallying cry asking for other members of her profession to take meaningful action on climate, which despite animals holding no responsibility for the causes of climate change, were feeling the consequences most strongly. After some deliberation about how to go about it, a core group of individuals decided to aim high and establish a professional staffed climate advocacy organisation. And the Vets for Climate Action was formed. And since then, it's been full steam ahead, developing strategy, securing funding and empowering a growing number of volunteers. We've made submissions to government, appeared in the media and inspired the people we work with to take climate action. In 2020, Professor Peter Doherty, the only veterinarian to win a Nobel Prize, became our patron. Vets for Climate Net Action is now a DGR registered charity with a team of six, a growing number of volunteers, leading those who love, care and work for animals, work with animals to act urgently on climate change because animals matter. And we're very privileged tonight to have uh, um, Dr. Donna White um, uh, put aside some time and effort to put together this presentation tonight. Donna, a little bit about Donna, she completed her veterinary degree at Sydney University. She spent several years working as a general practitioner and emergency veterinarian in Australia, the UK and Canada. Donna then followed her passion for pain management by undertaking specialty training in veterinary anaesthesia and analgesia at Sydney University. Since completing her training in 2018, Donna has worked in several private referral hospitals in Sydney and runs the Sydney Animal Pain Clinic. The carbon cost of anaesthesia is an increasingly recognised contribution to global warming. Of the common, commonly available inhalation anaesthetics, isoflurane is currently the most widely used in veterinary practice, being well recognised as safe and cost effective. However, isoflurane carries with it a high carbon cost. For a medium sized small animal practice, it's responsible for about 7% of the carbon footprint. As all businesses in Australia transition to net zero by 2050, we will need to find a zero carbon alternative. For this to occur without compromising patient safety, the transition to zero carbon anaesthesia will present significant challenges to the practice of veterinary anaesthesia. It will require widespread technical, educational, 
and financial changes within the profession. And so to the best of our knowledge, this is the first formal veterinary webinar examining this issue in Australia. And we're honoured to have Donna White, an accomplished presenter and specialist veterinary anaesthetist to officially start the journey to net zero veterinary anaesthesia in Australia. So with a warm welcome to Donna, I will hand over to her for her presentation tonight. Thank you, Jeremy. That is a, a very big <laughs> intro and <laughs> I'm not sure if I can uh, answer how we're going to get exactly to net zero, but I'm going to try and uh, get us as close as we can. Um, so you need me to share my screen now. Oh, I can't. It says I can't share just at the moment the other participant is sharing. <laughs> All right, let me. Sorry, I'm just trying to work out how to get it to the whole screen and it was working a bit better before, wasn't it? Just going to stop sharing that just for one second. Let's see. Boom. Okay. All right. Hopefully, is that worked? No, no, yet. Oh, no, it looks like it has on my screen. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Got there. It's no mean feat. Okay. Uh, so, this is my kind of animal mascot that I've popped on the front here uh, the bin chicken or the ibis. Um, in Sydney, he's our climate refugee. So, we have lots of ibis in. Sydney that had to migrate here about 10 years ago um, because their habitats in the rest of New South Wales um, are slowly being wiped out by climate change. So we see lots of them in the city. And for me, it's a constant reminder of the carbon cost of our times. Um, and then isoflurane, it's what we're going to talk about mostly tonight. So a little bit of an overview um, I'm going to try and talk about the source of our costs. Obviously, in the introduction, you know that isoflurane is our main one we're going to talk about, but there are some others. Um, and I'm, I'm going to try and bring it back to how we can make a difference now um, and really try and make it as clinically relevant as I can for everybody. And then the potential future improvements. So I guess what we want is we want sustainable practice um, and I think we need to kind of, when we think about that, you know, the UN has this amazing definition, which is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And, you know, when we talk about anesthesia, probably a lot of what we're doing is not sustainable. It really does meet the needs of us now and our generation, but we probably are compromising our future generations with some of the anesthetics that we use. So there's a, a huge body of literature that's ever increasing on this topic. And these are some of, I've got references at the end if anyone's interested, but these are some of the ones that I've used along the way. Um, probably the biggest one here is the one on the right. So the Environmental Sustainability and Veterinary Anesthesia. It's a really good review article that was put out and it kind of brings it all back to the vet world. So most of what we're seeing worldwide now in every country, you know, the medical world generally has a, um, a plan for how to reduce carbon emissions um, in medicine and then specifically in anesthesia. So in Australia, the Diebel Institute was a 
report that was put out about decarbonizing clinical care and there's a fair bit in there about anesthesia so there's lots out there if you want to read it it's all very overwhelming um, and like I said I've tried to pare it all back as much as I can to make it relevant to us tonight so where do these costs come from so for anesthesia uh, predominantly we're talking about pharmaceuticals and we're talking about waste so obviously um, the uh, injectable anesthetics and analgesics, uh, inhalational ones, all that waste um, that we all see every day in practice when we use our single use syringes um, and vials of medicine and everything that gets thrown out, um, lots of plastic that goes, um, disposable drapes, things like that, that we're constantly kind of seeing and often um, I find quite shocking on a day to day basis. And then, of course, there's other things like from an anesthesia point of view, you know, the anesthetic machine, the monitor, um, if you use ventilators, anything like that. So the electricity that goes into those. So when you look into um, assessing the carbon costs of practice and specifically anesthesia, but any practice um, what you'll read about is a cradle to grave analysis, so a life cycle analysis. So we need to take into consideration everything, so extraction, processing, manufacturing, assembly, the use, so it's not just that you open the plastic syringe and you take it and you pop it in the bin once you've used it that one time. You know, there's a whole process that's got that syringe into your hand and then into the bin. Um, so everything that we use, um, we're trying to have a life cycle analysis or when you're reading about the carbon cost of, of what we're doing, it's always goes back to this life cycle analysis. And so we'll kind of talk about that a little bit more as we assess the different areas of anesthesia. Um, and really what we're talking about here is waste anesthetic gases. So um, inhalation or anesthetic agents, they are far and away um, our biggest carbon cost for anesthesia. So they are greenhouse gases. Um, so there's lots of greenhouse gases. So carbon dioxide is the one we're all fairly familiar with, methane, nitrous oxide, water vapour, and then the inhalation or anesthetic, um, anesthetic agents. So a couple of years ago, there was um, an estimate of the global impact was about 4.4 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent. Um, and you compare that to a global emission of 49 gigatons. So it's, it's not huge, um, but there's a reason why it's really important. And we kind of need to go back to the basics and think about what a greenhouse gas is. So they're actually, I mean, traditionally, they're, they're a good thing, greenhouse gases. Um, so we have incoming solar radiation from the sun um, that comes down into the earth. It's absorbed by the earth and then there's outgoing infrared radiation um, that that's converted to. So uh, that outgoing infrared radiation, some of it is trapped um, by greenhouse gases and it's uh, reflected back to the earth and that actually warms the earth. So, you know, pre um, industrial times that was a good thing because it kept the earth warm so it kept us warm and it, um, enabled us to live so there's this atmospheric window um, between 8 to 12 nanometers uh, where traditional um, greenhouse gases they didn't really act so there was kind of a means for the earth to cool itself so the solar radiation came in, the infrared radiation goes out, and there was kind of this window um, where we could, uh, you know, that infrared radiation could escape and it could be cooled. Um, and hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. This diagram helps a little bit more. So you can kind of see here there's this, um, you know, we've got a carbon dioxide and we've got water vapour, uh, which are, you know, greenhouse gases that are absorbing that infrared radiation and sending it back to the earth you see in that middle window that kind of eight to 14 micrometers window wavelength um, that's where the infrared radiation would escape but our anesthetic agents our inhalation or anesthetic agents they actually are uh, within the atmosphere in that really critical cooling window 
So actually, um, they're disproportionately effective greenhouse gases. And that's why, although there's not a huge amount, we're not pumping out thousands of tons, well, we are pumping out thousands of tons, but not huge amounts in comparison. It's the fact that they are so effective within that cooling window that makes them um, quite detrimental and, you know, really important contributors to, um, to climate to the increase in climate. So there is an estimate that they've contributed about 10 to 15% of man-made radiative increase since pre-industrial times, which is, you know, it's really significant. So are they all equal? So when we talk about inhalation or anesthetic agents, there's lots that have come and gone that we don't use anymore. Um, Halothane is probably one that we can all remember. There's certainly ones before those. But the ones we're talking about nowadays that are commonly in practice are isofluorane, sevofluorane, desfluorane, nitrous oxide. Um, and they're not all equal. So when we're talking about their effects, their greenhouse gas effects, um, they're not equal. So generally what we talk about is um, their atmospheric lifetime, their global warming potential, and their carbon dioxide equivalents. So atmospheric lifetime is literally that. So how long once they're... Uh, breeds off by your patient and released into the atmosphere, how long do they hang around for? And so we can see isofluorine, it's 3.2 years. So it's a lot. It's a long time. Um, Sevofluorine, 1.1. Desfluorine is 14 years. So it's, you know, it's really persistent. Nit nitrous oxide is 110. It's a long time. Um, global warming potential. So that's that atmospheric lifetime times by the the their actual ability to reflect that radiation back to earth. So isofluorine, um, 510 is its global warming potential, sevofluorine 130, desfluorine 2540 and nitrous oxide 310. So isofluorine, it's not the worst, desfluorine probably is, um, and nitrous oxide is certainly um, that really long atmospheric lifetime is very detrimental. Um, but it's certainly not the best. And it's still significant. I mean, even sevofluorine, you can see it's hanging around for a significant amount of time and it's got a significant global warming potential. So carbon dioxide equivalents, that's literally just a means that we can directly um, compare these. So um, you can see isofluorine is three. So not as good as sevofluorine, but certainly better than des and nitrous oxide. Another really nice comparison that gets thrown around a lot if you do a little bit of um, reading is um, how what's the equivalent to driving in your car? So when we talk about MAC, that's the mean alveolar um, concentration required to keep the dog asleep for an hour. So if you do an hour of isofluorine, if you have a, an hour long surgery of, with a dog um, tomorrow and you've used isofluorine, um, at an amount to keep that dog asleep for surgery or an average amount, it's equivalent to you driving 19 kilometres. This is hit in picture form, which is, uh, you know, a little bit nicer, kind of sticks in your head a little bit more. Uh, so this is from England, um, the NHS, and what we're talking about here, this is a nice, um, some nice literature that they did just to show the global warming potential versus actually what's used in clinics. Um, so you can see uh, desfluorine is really, you know, has the potential to, to have some fairly detrimental effects, but actually clinically it's not used in as high amounts as something like nitrous oxide, which is used really commonly in labour wards at the dentist, um, you know, and in emergency of nitrous oxide is really, really important. Um, what's the relevance to us in the veterinary world? Probably minimal. I think um, certainly my practice, I don't use not nitrous oxide. I don't think we use it in general practice very much, if at all. Um, and desfluorine, desfluorine does get used a bit. I've used it a bit myself. Um, I wouldn't anymore, but it's a, it is still out there, especially for equine practice. It's used, nitrous and desfluorine are used um, not infrequently in medical anesthesia practice um, in Australia, and it is estimated they're used more than in other countries. Um, the Another thing to consider with isofluorine 
and um, halothane and nitrous oxide is that they have this additional negative effect where they actually directly destroy some of the protective ozone molecules. So any reduction that we do is got to be a good thing. So these are some nice apps um, and they're quite fun. Um, so Gas in Greener is a US app um, and the anesthetic impact calculator is one from the UK, um, but they're both really good. You can download them on your phone really easily and you can per patient, you put your patient weight in, you put the um, anesthetics that you're going to use for that patient and it will give you the carbon cost of that anesthetic. So I've got some more examples of that further down, but they're fun um, and, you know, it's good to see actually what, what you're doing and what impact you're having. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm just going to take a drink. Um, so here, this is just more to highlight the difference between desflurane and isoflurane. So if you need to keep a dog asleep on desflurane, you need to have it on about, you need to have your vaporizer on about 10. If you've got your oxygen flow on two, which is pretty standard, <coughs> excuse me, your carbon cost of that is 233 carbon um, dioxide equivalents. That's pretty huge. Now, if we have the Mac of a dog, so we need to have our vaporizer on about 1.6 and two litres of oxygen per minute, um, the carbon cost of that is about 7.6. So, you know, it's still a lot, um, but we can see that desflurane is really not something that we should be persisting with in the future. So our initial steps forward. So interestingly, Scotland has just banned desflurane and the NHS, so the UK, is about to ban it next year. And I feel like this is something that we will see worldwide. Unfortunately, Australia is a little bit lagging. So that Diebel report um, that I mentioned earlier down on the bottom left there, sorry, it's really small writing. They had no tables that were good summaries, but... Um, they certainly recommending that we reduce nitrous um, and desflurane in Australia, but there's no bans and it certainly doesn't seem like there's any in the near future, but I think that's where we should be looking. Um, that picture there, that's my, that's actually my daughter last Friday. Um, so she's four years old and that's her with a strawberry flavoured nitrous mask on. So she had to have a small procedure done. It was painful. Um, and they just placed some nitrous with um, strawberry flavour and she loved it. So, you know, moving forward, what's the alternative to things like this where it's considered very safe? Um, Paediatric patients um, maintain their airway. I'm not sure. Um, and I'm not sure it's a question for us as vets to answer, um, but it does show you how difficult um, some of these questions will be to answer. Okay, so what about us? What about in our day-to-day -day practice? So isoflurane certainly is the primary agent that we use. Um, why? I think probably because it's cheap is the main reason. It is significantly cheaper than sevoflurane. Um, I've used sevoflurane a little bit myself, and I certainly used it a lot in the UK where it's more common. Clinically, the benefits of sevoflurane, I think, are minimal. Um, you might get a slightly faster recovery, a slightly... Um, faster induction into your anesthetic state but clinically probably the benefit of that doesn't outweigh um, the cost to most practices so we really need to think about how we're going to reduce our isoflurane use so we need we, we have this target in Australia of a 50% reduction in our emissions by 2025 and we've certainly got a net zero emissions targets by 2050 um, following the Paris Agreement so we need to reduce and replace is probably what we can do now. Um, and recycling is something I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, it's not something that's available now, but it may be where we're headed. So the first thing that we can do to reduce our use is reduce our oxygen flow rates, use appropriate oxygen flow rates for our patient size, um, use appropriate isofluorine rates uh, for our patient size and for the surgery that's required, monitor our patients 
um, and use some adju um, adjunctive agents and possibly some partial intravenous anesthesia. So I'll talk about those a little bit more. So the first thing we can do is use an appropriate oxygen flow rate. And it's definitely the first recommendation for medical or veterinary anesthesia. If you do any research into reducing your carbon cost is using an appropriate oxygen flow rate. So when I, I do a fair bit of anesthesia training in clinics and when I go in and I'll say, what circuit are we choosing? And it's almost always which is in the small circuit for the small patient and the large circuit for the large patient. Um, sometimes people know why and sometimes they don't. Um, I guess clinically it probably doesn't matter because that's, you know, they've got a chart and the patient is a chihuahua, so it's going on this Bain circuit here, or the patient's a rottweiler, so it's going on our circle system. But it does make a really big difference. Um, and there's a subset of patients that fall probably that fall between these two circuits and making a choice for a rebreathing circuit can really reduce the carbon cost of that anesthetic. So um, when we talk about uh, non rebreathing versus a rebreathing circuit, the difference we're talking about is how the carbon dioxide is eliminated from that circuit. So the Bain circuit, the non rebreathings or the T-piece you might use in your practice, those little circuits that were popping on little patients, there's no soda lime. And there's no soda lime because the patients are small um, and because their breath is small, they, they need, because they're, they're small bodies, to get rid of the oxygen, we use a high, the carbon dioxide, we use a high oxygen flow rate. So 200 mils per kilo per minute, sorry, I've written an hour there, um, per minute. And so, you know, we have to turn those up high. So a five kilo patient needs a liter of oxygen every minute. So it's quite a lot. Um, and that's because those high oxygen flow rates are how we're getting rid of the carbon dioxide. So that patient's not rebreathing any of their carbon dioxide. Now, if we put them on a rebreathing circuit, um, we've got soda lime. And so the soda lime takes the carbon dioxide away. And because of that, we can turn our oxygen down. We don't need high flow oxygen to push all that carbon dioxide out. And so we can use 10 to 30 mils per kilo per minute. So much, much lower rates. The less oxygen you have going through, the less oxygen flow rate you have, the less isoflurane that you have going straight through and out into the environment. So it makes a big difference turning it down. So if you've got a patient that is um, five kilos and you put them on a rebreathing circuit, asking that patient to breathe through the soda lime, ask them to breathe through a high resistance. And so what might happen is that when you anesthetize them, they get exhausted. So if you've got a catenograph on, um, their CO2 will slowly increase and they might not actually have the ventilatory drive to to um, get rid of their CO2. And that's why we put them on the smaller circuits because it's got a low resistance. But there are pediatric circle systems. Um, and I think that AAS, um, Darvel actually even make some of these circle systems that go down to two kilos now. So low resistance circle systems. So you can have very small patients with very low oxygen flow rates. But even the bigger patients, if you work out, so if you've got a 20 kilo dog um, and you put it on a rebreathing circuit and you work out your 10 to 30 mils per kilo per minute, you know, a 20 kilo dog could be on um, 200 mils per kilo per minute. You know, if you want to go high just for safe and you want to put them on 1200 that's still a lot less than probably what most people are doing in day practice. I think it's fairly standard for us just to go two of ISO, two of uh, two liters of oxygen per minute, and we kind of walk away. And it's it's much more than what our patient needs. So they don't need that much oxygen, um, and all the oxygen, all the iso excess isoflurane that's scavenged out, that's just released into our atmosphere. So actually having a something on your anesthetic chart is what I recommend where at the beginning of the anesthetic, when we're preparing the anesthetic, we just calculate the patient weight, 
what breathing circuit we're putting them on and therefore what their oxygen flow rate is and just actually put the oxygen flow rate on that. So for the first couple of minutes while we're um, priming the circuit with the oxygen and the isoflurane, we do need to have them up a little bit higher. But after five minutes, there should be something on your anesthetic record that just says, okay, this is the oxygen flow rate that this patient requires. And it will be a lot less than what most people are doing. And then the next thing we can do is we can actually reduce the isoflurane. So again, I think a lot of us, we just do two and two and look for most surgeries. That's probably, it keeps the patient asleep. It keeps them breathing on their own. They don't move. You can do your spay or you can do your stitch up or you could do your orthopedic surgery. Um, but it, but we don't need, we often don't need them on that high. So look at your patient, you know, check their depth of anesthesia, check their jaw tone, check their eyes. Can we turn that isoflurane down? You know, I do a lot of training about turning the isoflurane down because it's very vasodilatory and it causes hypotension in a lot of cases, but actually tur turning it down just because the patient doesn't need it and there's less in the environment is a really important reason as well. Um, <clears throat> using adjunctive drugs is really important. Um, so the simplest thing that we can do is probably give a good pre-med. So if you give a good pre-med to a patient, that patient is going to have a much more stable anesthetic on a low, lower isoflurane than a patient that you've gassed down that has nothing but isoflurane. If you then add in some injectable ketamine, some methadone, a fentanyl infusion, a ketamine infusion, you can turn your iso down further. And a lot of the times we're doing that to turn the isoflurane down to manage our patient's hypotension. But again, we turn the isoflurane down and we reduced our anesthetic ga gas waste. Uh, regional anesthesia, so probably the one that we're all really familiar with is doing some dental blocks. And if you do good dental blocks in a patient, you can often have your ISO on 1% or less and that patient doesn't move. So the isoflurane is there keeping them from spontaneous movement, but those nerve blocks are stopping them from having any kind of pain or sympathetic stimulation. So it's a really good way to keep your ISO down. Um, you know, can you do a line block for a stitch up that you're doing? Can you do an epidural um, can you do a femoral and sciatic nerve block? And a lot of these things are things that you can do um, and you can learn to do in practice. All right, so here's an example. So Meg's a six-month-old crossbred. So she weighs eight kilos and she's here for a spay. So which circuit will we choose? So eight kilos, I've chosen that weight because that's kind of on the borderline. Um, depends on the practice, but some practices kind of have seven kilos as their cutoff. Some practices have 10 kilos as their cutoff. So I would say this is an eight kilo dog. Let's try it on the rebreathing circuit. Let's see how she goes. It's, you know, if you've got capnography, this is a really easy thing to do because if, if that patient is struggling, what you'll find is their CO2 will go up because they'll be less able to expel their breath through the soda lime. Okay, so um, what's the oxygen flow rate going to be for Meg on a non-rebreathing? So let's say um, we do 30 mils per kilo per minute and she weighs eight kilos, so it's going to be 240 mils versus a rebreathing, which we're going to do 200 mils, and that's going to be 1.6 litres. So, sorry, a non rebreathing. So, even on a non rebreathing, 1.6 liters is less than that kind of standard two and two. All right, so giving her a good pre med is going to reduce the amount of isoflurane that we need. Um, so, something like metatomidine and methadone, something long acting. So, you know, don't use, you know, butorphanol or something short acting that's not going to last into your anesthetic. Um, should we add a drug? into our induction. So we're giving our faxin or we're giving propofol. Should we add some ketamine in, you know, and then that may be there and helping during our anesthetic. If we maintain her, so we're going to maintain her in isoflurane and oxygen, should we add in a fentanyl infusion? Should we add in a ketamine infusion? All, the, you know, both of those things, or should we give her some injectable methadone? Um, those things are going to reduce the amount of isoflurane that we need. Could we do a line block? Could we do a tap block? Could we do an epidural? And you could. You could do all of those things 
and that's going to reduce the amount of isoflurane that she needs. Here's Frank. Frank's a 10-month-old dash hound. He weighs seven kilos. So again, he's in that subset where we might be tempted to put him just straight on to the bane or the non-rebreathing, but let's try him on a rebreathing. Let's try and reduce our oxygen flow rates. He's got a fractured femur. Um, so at seven kilos, um, you know, his oxygen flow rate at 200 mils per kilo per minute would be about 1.4 on that bane circuit. We could reduce that um, to around 200 um, on a non-rebreathing. So we want to make sure he's got a good pre-med on board. We want to potentially co-induce with ketamine. Uh, we're going to maintain him. Should we do some um, partial intravenous anesthesia? So should we put him on fentanyl? Should we put him on ketamine? Um, or if you're more familiar with morphine um, or MLK CRIs, all these things that we do reduce our isoflurane. Could we do some regional anesthesia? And so this photo here, he's having a femoral and sciatic nerve block. And so actually by blocking that area, we can significantly reduce isoflurane. So a lot of orthopedics on hind legs, so a lot of TPLOs, fracture repairs. Um, I am anticipating having these guys on 1% um, because they've got regional anesthesia on board. Okay, so what about just replacing isoflurane? Um, so should we just switch to sevoflurane? Um, so when we talked about back at the beginning, uh, all anesthetic agents created equal and we said they're not. And you can see sevoflurane does kind of stand out there as a better inhalational anesthetic agent. So it's got left time, less time in the atmosphere. It's got less global warming potential. So it's tempting. Um, should we be using total intravenous anesthesia? And what about sedation and local anesthesia? So interestingly, repl just replacing isoflurane with sevoflurane is probably not as clinically um, amazing as we would hope. So there was a really good study. This is from a Canadian vet journal a couple of years ago. And what they did was they actually worked out the clinical um, equivalency of using products. And I remember I said, um, we talked about MAC at the beginning. So the MAC of sevoflurane in a dog is quite high. So to keep a dog asleep on sevoflurane, you actually need to have your vaporizer up to about 2.3 and probably a little bit higher because um, MAC is just what keeps 50% of dogs asleep. So isoflurane is around 1.6. So actually the, you know, the global warming potential there on the left, you can see there seems to be quite a, a difference, but the clinical use of those drugs, the um, ISO and the SIVO are fairly similar. So just switching to sevoflurane is not going to give us the clinical benefits of reduced greenhouse gas emissions um, that we would hope for. So it's not the answer. Should we just replace it entirely? So should we be doing total intravenous anesthesia? Um, should we do, be doing our Faxon or propofol CRIs? Should we be mixing them with fentanyl, metatomidine, midazolam? And we've probably all done this at some point for some case. Um, you may have had a seizuring dog that's had to be on a propofol CRI, or you may have had to ventilate a tick paralysis case, and you've popped it on a propofol or a Faxon CRI. Um, anyone who throws their minds back to vet school or who still does a bit of large animal anesthesia, um, equine vets do a great job of doing TIVA. So um, this is field anesthesia. If you can remember triple drip. Um, so you kind of hang your bag of triple drip, which is, you know, a variety of anesthetic agents, um, guafenicin and um xylazine and ketamine in a bag and you kind of you run it into the horse and you increase your drip rate if the, if the horse starts to wake up and you reduce it if the horse goes to sleep um and you know in field anesthesia and equine this is done for about an hour uh, with total intravenous anesthesia and then the horse stands up and and it's amazing so I think you know this is a really we do this really well equine vets do TIVA really well um, the other thing that gets talked about a little bit is, you know, are we just doing a CRI or are we doing a target controlled infusion? So probably if this is the future 
of um, reducing our carbon costs, we probably need to be doing something a little bit more called target controlled infusions. So because if we just run propofol continuously for an hour, it actually builds up in the patient's body. So the benefit of isoflurane is they breathe it in, they breathe it out. There's very little um, systemic metabolism. Alfaxin and propofol, it takes a little bit more time for the body to metabolize and eliminate those drugs. So what we need is we need actual infusion pumps that work out what the current therapeutic level is in the patient's blood and and we reduce the amount and, and that is available and there have been studies done in dogs and cats and a few different species and it is a thing that's commonly done in people it's probably not relevant to a lot of us right now what we're going to do is we're going to set up our facts and CRI and we're going to work out six to eight mgs per kg per hour and we're just going to push start TIVA is not a particularly pleasant way to do anesthesia I don't know if it's the answer that we're looking for because um, inhalational gases are that we're very we're all very comfortable with them. Tiva, if you do a Tiva anesthetic, um, it's a little bit jumpier. Um, there's a little bit more reaction. It really does require a dedicated anesthetist um, to stand there and 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 fiddle with it as required for the surgery. Certainly adding adjunctives in, so doing alfaxin and fentanyl, alfaxin and metatomidine or something else helps because you can reduce the dose of each drug. Uh, so there's, you know, there's heaps of studies in people. There's a, there is quite a big push for propofol TCIs um, instead of agent instead of inhalational agents where possible and you can see up the top here we're talking about greenhouse gas emissions you can see there's none with propofol um, there certainly are some of those life cycle analysis things to consider so there's manufacturing um, soybean oil you know that needs to come from a replaceable um, source um, and you know there's manufacturing there's there's syringes and all that so it's still really low um, but compared like here we're comparing it to inhalational agents so there is a carbon cost but comparatively it's much less so <clears throat> something that i think that we are really really good at as vets is intramuscular anesthesia and i think we really underutilize it. This is my own dog here. Um, I castrated him, I don't know, maybe a year ago now. And uh, he's just castrated under some IM sedation. So he had some metatomidine and some methadone and some local blocks. And he did wonderful. He was great. He was completely um, deeply sedated. I probably could have intubated him. Um, but, you know, I blocked him. He didn't feel anything. He didn't react. I reversed him and he woke up really quickly. And this is something that's really common. I mean, if you think about all the spay clinics out there um, in third world countries, there's huge um, spay and neuter programs. And a lot of those are intramuscular anesthesia. So there's a lot of ketamine-based anesthesia out there. And it works really well. I really like it if you mix it with an alpha-2 so you can reverse it. I think that we should be doing a lot of our spays and neuters in clinics and probably a lot of our quick procedures, our x-rays, um, things that we probably now sometimes will give a bit of our faxin and we might put them on a little bit of gas. A lot of those procedures can be done under IM sedation. I worked in a um, charity in the UK for five years and we did all our spays and neuters under intramuscular anesthesia and it was great. Um, it worked well. I was very used to the protocol. Um, I knew what to expect. They had catheters placed. Um, they didn't often need topping up, but it was an option. So um, if we think about all our exotic and wildlife anesthesia, um, you know, we're really good at this. And I think we've moved away from this big time in general practice. And I think we probably need to have a move back to getting comfortable with intramuscular anesthesia or intravenous. I mean, a lot of the drugs that we're talking about, combinations that we're talking about can be used intravenously. Um, but I think this is a really 
good way that we are good at um, of reducing isoflurane. So familiarity is the key. So you need to use a protocol that you are comfortable with. So we're all very comfortable with isoflurane. We can put a tube in, we put them on gas. We know what to expect. We're, we're very comfortable with that. So if you get comfortable with using a metatomidine ketamine opioid protocol, it'll be the same. You'll get to know it. Reversibility can increase that comfort level. So um, the patient can wake up quickly. If you don't like what's happening, you can reverse it. So that can help kind of the transition into these protocols. Zolotil is one that's used really very commonly um, and people generally are quite comfortable with, Ketmodaz. Um, so I think there's this um, kind of trend to, to just put it on gas quickly because they wake up quickly. Um, but if we're talking about reducing the carbon costs of anesthesia, I think this is a viable alternative. So here's a case example. So this is a rabbit that I did a couple of weeks ago. Um, he was a three-year-old 1.5 kilo rabbit. He was in the clinic for a dental. So previously um, he'd been anesthetized with isoflurane um, and He's a small animal, so he needed a TP, so he needed a non-rebreathing system. So for isoflurane, he needed high flow oxygen. Also, um, it wasn't possible to intubate him. His isoflurane was given via the nose um, because the surgeon needed access to his mouth. So the isoflurane levels are probably a little bit higher than if he had a tube in. Um, you know, my what I did for this guy was I did total intramuscular anesthesia so that TEMA so I did a metatomidine ketamine buprenorphine mix on this guy so it's big doses it was intramuscular and it kept him in the sleep for a long time uh, we combined it with some dental blocks and we topped him up with a, a bit of our faxin um, when needed but it worked well we had him on supplemental oxygen so we eliminated isoflurane from this guy's anesthetic it's not something that the surgeon was familiar with and it's not something that they were comfortable with. Um, but the next time they'll get a little bit more comfortable and the next time they'll get a little bit more comfortable, we could reverse him and he woke up great. Henry's a three-year-old pug who weighs 12 kilos. So, again, he's sitting on that borderline and he's a pug, he's 12 kilos, so he's probably a bit overweight. And so his ideal body weight is probably actually something like nine or 10. So he needs a mass removal on his left hind leg. So what's our circuit choice? So actually, um, you know, a non-rebreathing circuit may be what Henry needs because if he's a little bit more overweight, his ability to ventilate when he's under anesthesia um, might be more obtunded. Um, overweight animals do find it harder to expand their chest. And if you're monitoring CO2 in these guys, you'll see that. Um, so what's our oxygen flow rate? So obviously it's, a you know, that we have to put him on the rebreathing circuit. It's a lot higher. So what are our options for Henry? So he needs a mass removal from his left hind leg. So we could potentially, I mean, so we could do probably what our standard is, is we give him a pre-med, we induce him, we pop a tube in and we pop him in isoflurane. We take the mass out, we wake him up and we give him some non -steroidals. Um, if we're going to reduce our carbon cost of that anesthesia, maybe we could do total intravenous anesthesia. So maybe we could do an alfaxin CRI or a propofol CRI. Um, maybe we could do total intramuscular anesthesia. So, or maybe we could do um, a sedation and a nerve block. So maybe we could do mandatomidine methadone and we could actually do a nerve block of that area. So it is a hind leg. So we've got the option of a couple of nerve blocks back there. If you're not comfortable with those, you could do um, a line block or some local, just some regional, a regional block. The reason that I've chosen a pug here is because we do want to tube in. So I, I don't actually do IM sedations or anesthetics in pugs without a tube. I do IM sedations and anesthetics a lot, but as soon as they're brachycephalics, I do put a tube in. And so with these guys, um, you know, having gas is is probably the standard. It doesn't have to be though. So you can still do your intravenous anesthesia and your intramuscular anesthesia, pop your tube on and you can have them on oxygen. 
So there are, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to not have a tube in because you're doing intravenous anesthesia or intramuscular. We can still place the tube. We can still have airway control. Just don't have to turn the isoflurane on. Okay, so here's our summary for reducing and replacing. So oxygen flow rates are really, really important. So choose a rebreathing circuit wherever you can. If your patient is borderline, um, then go for the rebreathing and see how they go. Monitor your CO2. Um, and maybe look into, if you are looking into new circuits, um, have a look at the low flow um, circuits for uh, lower weight patients. So like I said, I'm pretty sure there's some circuits out there now for patients, some circle circuits from two kilos. Calculate your flow rates. So if you can add it to your anesthetic sheet, just have somewhere on the sheet where you actually calculate what flow rate that patient needs and make sure that that's what the patient gets. And ideally, when we are reducing low flow rates, we really need to use a capnograph because what will happen is if the flow is too low, the patient will rebreathe some of their carbon dioxide because the flow isn't high enough to help the patient um, eliminate the carbon dioxide. So they will inspire some carbon dioxide. Isoflurane, so dose to effect. So don't just put them on two and walk away and not think about it again. Actually check your patient, turn it down. Add in some fentanyl, add in some ketamine, add in something else to reduce your isoflurane. So I'm really big. I use ketamine CRIs in most of my anesthetics. I really like it. It's cheap. Um, it's easy. Most patients tolerate it well and I can reduce my anesthetic. Fentanyl is another really commonly used one that we're familiar with. We're quite comfortable with opioids in our in veterinary practice. So that's another one you might consider. Can you use TIVA? Can you use TIMA? Would you use partial intravenous anesthesia? And can you add some nerve blocks or some regional anesthesia? And so all these things that can help reduce or even replace isoflurane. Okay. So you're doing, you're doing great, Donna. Just like okay. a five minute warning. Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. Okay, fine. Um, so this is that app that I talked about before, and this is just kind of to reinforce what we were talking about. So um, you can see up the top, so if we've got our isoflurane on 2% and our oxygen flow rate on 2%, our carbon equivalent is 9.5, so per hour. Now, if we reduce our oxygen flow rate, so here that the second one um, on the right. So we've reduced the oxygen flow rate down to one litre per minute. Our carbon equivalent is 4.7. So pretty significant decrease. If we can reduce that again, down to half a litre per minute, we've reduced our carbon cost of that anaesthetic per hour to 2.4. Um, now, what about turning down the isoflurane? So again, we're going to start on 2.2 and 2. Um, fairly standard. Now, if we reduce our isoflurane down to 1.6, which is the MAC in dogs, so that mean alveolar concentration, we've reduced our carbon cost of that anesthetic to 7.6. We reduce it again. So let's say we've put a fentanyl CRI on and we've reduced it again down to 1% or we've done a nerve block. We've actually reduced that, the carbon cost of that anesthetic to 4.7. So really big um, savings in our greenhouse gas admission. Let's do both. So let's reduce our ISO, let's reduce our oxygen flow rate. Um, so we've gone from 9.5, so we've now got the patient on 1% isoflurane and half a litre of oxygen. And our carbon cost of that anaesthetic is 1.2. So really, really significant stuff that we can do now. And um, it, you, know, you can do it tomorrow. You can start reducing how much isoflurane we're popping out there into the environment. Um, so some other things. So in the future, you know, we are, there, there's lots of research out there to try and actually, rather than just scavenge and um, push all the an waste anesthetic gases out into the environment, which is what happens now, um, whether you've got passive or ac active scavenge, whatever it is, it's, it's going out into the environment um, so we're going to try, there are some systems there, there's a couple there, 
where they actually capture the anesthetic gases and they recycle them. There's none that are clinically in use. I think there's a, a group of hospitals in Canada that have some in use, but it's kind of a trial system. There's none that's available just yet, but it, it feels like we're getting close and that will be great. Um, but it's certainly not something that we can do tomorrow. Um, there's a lot of talk about xenon. Um, so xenon is a noble gas. And if you remember that periodic table of elements from chemistry, um, xenon's there. It's down on the right side of that table. So it's here. And actually xenon has some anesthetic properties. And it, it seems like it's a really great anesthetic, inhalational anesthetic agent. So it's a gas. It's not a, a vapor like the others. It's not, It doesn't come in liquid form. Um, but it's got no cardiovascular side effects. It's got no greenhouse gas effects. There's rapid induction and emergence. Um, but unfortunately, it's very, very expensive to make. So it's produced by the fractional distillation of air um, and the carbon cost of making it is not insignificant. And although there's a lot of talk about xenon being kind of our saviour as far as gaseous anesthesia, um, it doesn't seem like it's the answer. And again, it's certainly not the answer for us tomorrow in our practice. Uh, other recommendations. So this is taken from that review that I mentioned at the beginning. There's heaps. Um, there's so many things. And Jeremy's practice um, has a list of them that they've done on their website. There's lots of ideas here. So certainly low fresh gas flows and monitoring isoflurane are up the top there, but there's lots of other things we can do. So turn your equipment off at night, um, you know, use appropriate size files. There's heaps there. And I really would, if you do have an interest in this area, I urge you to have a look at that review article. Okay, made it within the time. So thank you for listening. If you have any questions or um, if you want any more information, then you're certainly very welcome to email me. These are some of the references I used. I am very, very far from um, an expert on this topic. I have a, an interest in it, but um, if you do have an interest, then yeah, there's certainly the review of veterinary um, anesthesia. I'm just trying to find where that one is. Uh, that's the third one down. Environmental sustainability in veterinary anesthesia is a really good article. Thank you. Um, Thanks, Eve right. Stella. That was great. Okay. Um, we probably just have just a couple of minutes for questions. Um, we don't want to keep everyone too late. Um, but if anyone has questions, feel free to take yourself off mute and ask, or if you put it in the chat, um, I can ask Donna. Donna, can I just make a, a comment? Um, I think your comment about um, desflurane being banned in Scotland. Um, is perhaps a government regulation is perhaps um, a thing that the veterinary profession needs to be prepared for in the future. I mean, we're already seeing big, big industry in Australia having um, their carbon output um, regulated by government, and that's going to filter down to other industries. And and things like this are perhaps an, an example of the, that the veterinary profession needs to start preparing for this. And as as, as you've demonstrated, there's a lot of complexity. Um, and so it's going to take uh, time and resources to try and get it right. And we can't really wait around until the regulations are forced upon us. We need to be ready for it in advance. And so I think you've done a beautiful presentation tonight to try and simplify the complexity of all the options out there. So well done. Congratulations. Yeah, it's very overwhelming. <laughs> um, we do have a question um, from Anne Donna. What is a tap block? <laughs> Um, a tap block is a transabdominus planus block. So it's a block that you can do from abdominal procedures. Uh, yeah. I'm sure we can look that up. <laughs> I have a question as well, if you don't mind, Donna. Yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for this talk. I've been looking forward to it for a very long time. Um, and I was very interested about the intramuscular um, sedation um, set of um, in hornets. Um, it's not something that I've had too much exposure to. Um, do you just tend to use um, standard dose rates for any sedation um, that you do for, say, I don't know, um, like you're going to examine the, the back of the throat of um, a dog that's 
I don't know, retching or something, would you just use a standard dose for that? Um, is that sufficient for a spay? No, so you need to have uh, protocols in place. Um, so intramuscular anesthetic protocols. So normally for spays and castrates, um, the protocols I use are based on a metatomidine, ketamine, opioid, and if it's a pediatric, I'll add midazolam in, and they're big doses because you want you want anesthesia. So, you know, a, a much higher doses, um, and what I would, so what I typically, I mean, to be honest, I don't do a lot of it anymore. I do a lot of sedations and regional anesthesia. Um, I don't do spays and castrates, but I would have, what I did for the Animal Welfare League here is I just did a protocol and it just had with t a table with the weights and you look it up. And um, I think a lot of charities operate that way. Um, probably less so in Australia, I feel like. In the, the, I think the UK does IM anesthesia really, really well, um, especially the charity practice over there. But you need to have a protocol. It's usually three or four. You give it IM and the patient is anesthetized. You can place an IV. You can intubate them if you want. Um, but we're talking about big doses Okay, that, that definitely clarifies that. Um, <laughs> is, is there any specific reference that you would point people towards if they're looking for a protocol? Um, I would try and find my protocols. Um, shoot me an email. Um, I have because I know that I, I made a, a, a bunch of them for the Animal Welfare League, so I'll try and find them and get them out there. It's just... I mean, obviously you have to be quick if you're going to be taking an hour to do a spay, which is totally fine, especially for the for the new grads. But really, by the time you're experienced, you're doing spays much faster than that. And IM protocols are sufficient. I mean, cat castrates and dog castrates, I am anesthesia or I am sedation with a local block is more than sufficient. If you want an airway, you can place a tube, but you don't have to put the gas on. Mm -hmm. Lovely. Thank you so much again. Okay. Perfect. Thanks, everyone. Um, we better wrap it up there because we didn't want to keep people um, too late. Um, so just a kind of bit more um, housekeeping in terms of Vets of Climate Action. If you don't know much about us, um, please check out the website. Um, the Climate Care Program is up and running for its kind of first official um, yeah, so definitely worth having a look at that and thinking about whether the clinic might like to take part. Um, there is also the Lara Pinta Trek um, coming up later this year, um, which is going to be a great fundraising event. Um, I've done the Lara Pinta and I highly recommend it. So um, if anyone is interested, please check out the website and um, it'd be great to have you on board for that. Um, and just a heads up about our next masterclass in May. Um, the topic is a little bit, a little bit different. Um, so uh, coffee grounds and plastic bottles, what the veterinary profession can do with waste. So that's going to be um, a, a super interesting um, webinar about procurement and how we can, um, you know, get more sustainable uh, items in our clinics. So that's all from us tonight. Um, thanks again, Donna, for that great presentation. And thanks, Jeremy, for your awesome introduction. If anyone has any questions to follow up, don't hesitate to email vfca at info at vfca.org.au and we can pass those on to Donna. Um, and yeah, have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Good night. <laughs>